Hello everyone, this is Lillian. Along with Siddharth, Jonathan, and Camel, we'll be presenting on the mRNA vaccine design process. We split the topic into four sections. What are mRNA vaccines? How computational tools are applied in the design process? And also limitations and hopes in the mRNA vaccine. What is mRNA vaccine design? What? mRNA vaccines teach our bodies how to fight against certain viruses that may penetrate its immune system. Where? As the name suggests, this process takes place on the cellular level, where important proteins are made. How? When the vaccine enters the body, it teaches the cells how to make a protein that stimulates an action that produces antibodies, the proteins that protect cells from real viruses. How does the mRNA vaccine work? The whole point of the mRNA vaccine is to provide instructions for our cells to make a harmless copy of the spike protein, which is found on the surface of the COVID-19 virus. The best way to insert the vaccine into the body is to inject it on the upper arm muscle. The mRNA now inside the cells, the cells use the instructions to make the spike protein. After the protein is made, it will be recognized as a foreign object. So our immune system will make an effort to get rid of it by building an immune response and creating antibodies that will destroy the protein. The immune response that occurred when the spike protein was present is remembered by the immune system. So if there is any infections of the actual virus, the immune system will know how to defend itself. Now that we know how the vaccine works, let's take a look at the computational uh, aspect of it. After an introduction on what mRNA vaccines are, let's now look at how computational tools can be applied in the vaccine design process. First of all, why are we using computational tools in creating vaccines? Well, after millions of years of natural selection, there are multiple defense layers in the immune system, and that created a large amount of data. Computational tools is one of the only ways we can efficiently get useful information out of those large amount of data. Early stages of computational immunology was quite simple. Digu is the founder of Epivax, a computational immunology company, and her first computational algorithm was to understand how T-cells recognize pathogens. She copied a gene sequence into a warp processor and thereby identifies peptides that are recognized by MHC proteins, and the code works. What resulted from the simple algorithm was EpiMatrix, which breaks down pathogens protein into chunks of amino acid. This invention allowed us to reduce 99.8% of the epitope sequence, making the vaccine design process more efficient than ever. Now we know the background of computational immunology, but how can we apply it to the vaccine design process? For mRNA vaccines, the computer will generate the source code, or the gene sequence to produce the vaccine. The sequence is then uploaded to DNA printer, which will convert computer bytes to actual DNA. Then, after a lot of chemical and biological processing, the DNA produced turns to RNA, and that's the final vaccine product. With that being said, what's the source code made up with, or how do we create the source code? This is a diagram that categorizes the source code to a few important categories. Every sequence starts with a cap. It is just base, G, and A, which are also called the headers of the vaccine. After the headers, there is a sequence called the 5' untranslated region. This region will not be used to make the protein. Well, you may ask, if it's not being used, what's the purpose of having it? When making protein, ribosomes have to physically sit on the mRNA strand to start a translation process. This region provides the lead-in signal for translation and also contains metadata, such as when and how much should a translation happen. The S glycoprotein signal peptide is very short and it tells the cell where should the protein exit. After the 5' untranslated region and the S glycoprotein signal peptide, here comes the most important part of the source code. This is the sequence that produces the actual protein. This sequence for the vaccine protein has important changes from the original viral sequence. So there's a lot of substitutions of G nucleotides and some amino acids are being substituted to proline. Let's look at a diagram to visually see those changes. Here on the top of the diagram is the viral RNA, and on the bottom is the vaccine RNA. Here's a substitution where G is changed to a U, and more importantly, 
The AAA and UGG are changed to CCU, which is proline. So why are those changes being made? Well, those changes largely enhance vaccine's efficiency. Let's look at an example, the spike protein for the COVID vaccine. Those gray spots around the large white circle are the spikes of the protein. They will collapse into a different structure for the unmodified sequence. If that sequence is injected, the body will only have immunity against collapsed spike protein. And that is certainly not what we want. There is an idea introduced in 2017, which is double proline substitution. Proline is a very rigid amino acid. It will act as splint to stabilize proteins by taking up their prefusion configuration. With those important substitutions, spike proteins will not alter their shape, and they can be used for the vaccine. Just as how there's the 5' untranslated region, there's also the 3' untranslated region. They sound similar, but they have very different functions. There are still mysteries on the 3' untranslated region, but based on current research, we know that this region plays a crucial role in promoting protein expression. At the end of the sequence, we have the poly A tail. It is just a bunch of base A's at the end, and it protects the sequence from degradation. This end shortens every time when the strand is reused to produce the protein, and the strand will be discarded once there are no more A's in the poly A tail. Like I said in the beginning, computational tools largely make the vaccine design process more efficient. Before, it takes years and costs millions to design vaccines, but with computation, this process can be compressed into hours. However, no matter how precise the algorithms are, they can never substitute experimental data. Hypothesis generated may look well on paper, but failed on actual testing. Thus, even though computational immunity can help advance the vaccine design process, it is never a shortcut. We've talked about how mRNA vaccines are designed and how computation is involved in the mRNA vaccine. Now we will talk about the limitations of the mRNA vaccine. Currently, there are a lot of improvements needed to be added to the mRNA vaccine. I'll be talking about three of them. Immunogenicity, stability, and why the mRNA vaccine's effect won't be effective on bacterial and parasitic pathogens. Your body has two types of immune responses. One is innate, which activates immediately after the detection of the pathogen. The other is the adaptive immunity, which activates after exposure to one specific type of pathogen. Immunogenicity is the tendency for the cells to cause unwanted immune responses leading to side effects, commonly seen in symptoms of recently vaccinated patients for COVID-19. These symptoms include fever, chills, and headaches. IVT or invertebral transcribed mRNA commonly used to express a therapeutic protein can cause toll-like induced inflammation by activating the immune system. There are ways to reduce the immunogenicity of the mRNA vaccine. One example of this is to shorten the U-rich sequence of the mRNA. Another way is modifying the nucleotides so that there are more GC sequences and adding a poly A tail for stability. The last way is to purify the mRNA through various methods such as anion exchange, liquid chromatography, and affinity chromatography. Additionally, mRNA is very sensitive to degradation and must be stored in very low temperatures especially for the Pfizer vaccine. At room temperature, mRNA vaccine will degrade in less than a day. However, mRNA degradation is a normal process in your body that allows your cells to recycle mRNA after being used for the translation to pro synthesize proteins. The best way to retain the stability of the mRNA is to add the poly A tail. The poly A tail protects the mRNA molecule from enzymic uh, degradation in the cytoplasm and assists in transportation of the mRNA from the nucleus in translation. mRNA effects on parasites and bacteria. The mRNA does not work on parasites and bacteria. So far, no vaccine has been approved for bacterial or parasitic infections. This is because of the complexity of the bacterial structure and the complex reproduction processes that the parasites have. This chart shows that an E. coli bacteria is at least 10 times larger than any known virus. The mRNA vaccine might not work on bacteria and parasites, but luckily we already have very effective antibiotic and antiparasitic drugs that can easily cure these infections. As for the parasitic infections, there needs to be new production process in order, to, in order for the mRNA vaccine to target the antigens. Using traditional injection of wheat-based parasitic pathogens can increase the risk of infections. That is all for the limitations of the mRNA vaccine. Though there are numerous limitations to the usage of mRNA in vaccines, scientists continue exploiting mRNA technology to advance in the healthcare field. Let's look at some of these advantages of using mRNA as well as some applications and future hopes.
mRNA vaccines are more flexible. By enabling the cells to generate antigens, it avoids the costly, difficult purification of proteins and equips the proteins with typical features viral proteins have, like surface sugars and the correct 3D shape. The flexibility of this platform stems from the ease of working with genomic sequences. Inject the diligently defined sequences of A's, T's, C's, and G's, and voila, the cells do the rest. They're easy to design, produce, and test once the sequence of the pathogen is known. Also, beyond manufacturing benefits, some have suggested that, in theory, they may require less adjuvant because the mRNA itself is inherently stimulating to our immune systems. By the way, an adjuvant is a bolstering second molecule that signals danger to our immune system. In addition to the flexibility and convenience of mRNA, Recent studies show that its technological applications could possibly cure cancer. Dr. Scott Capetz and a team of other colorectal cancer specialists ran a clinical trial to use mRNA technology as a way to prevent colorectal cancer from occurring again. Just for some background information, after surgically removing a tumor, cancer cells in the body can remain and shed their DNA into the bloodstream. And this DNA found in the bloodstream is commonly referred to as circulating tumor DNA or ctDNA. The increase of ctDNA in the bloodstream heightens the risk of colorectal cancer recurring in the patient. So, personalized mRNA vaccines. In the trial, Capetz and his colleague Morris personalized an mRNA vaccine for patients with ctDNA found in their bloodstream. After the patient has surgery, for their tumor's tissue is sent to a lab and analyzed. It's tested for genetic mutations fueling its growth. The number of mutations could range from 5 to 20, and mutations are then sorted based on how often they occur. Mutations with frequent, with frequent occurrence have higher priority and are weighted more significantly when taking into account the design of the vaccine. So the vaccine is then created to fight the genetic mutations present in the analyzed tumor. And here is a diagram depicting a similar process that Dr. Capetz and Dr. Morris followed in their clinical trial. Let's take a deeper look into using mRNA for cellular therapies, particularly cancer immunotherapy. Once the vaccine is created, the targeted cells are transfected with mRNA, which gives directions to create molecules that would modify the cell's immune response. So a specific application of using mRNA in immunotherapy is the transfection of dendritic cells in the immune system, also known as DCs. The DCs are transfected with mRNAs, which encode tumor-associated antigens, also known as TAAs. So the DCs then process the TAA material and present the TAA peptides on the DC's surface, therefore activating the T cells, which are a type of white blood cell that aid in the body's adaptive immune response. So another application is the direct injection of mRNA into the patient's T cells. These mRNAs would encode chimeric antigen receptors, also known as CARs, and they are special receptors created in a lab that are designed to bind with specific proteins found on cancer cells. So once these receptors are added, the T cells are now aided in finding and destroying cancer cells containing the protein corresponding to the CAR. So here are our works cited, and here are more works. Thank you!